upon us right now, Father. If you would dispel the weak, the problems that we have in our homes, at our workplaces, in our marriages, in this church, we make this time about you, God, and we simply be the benefits, or we simply reap the benefits of your glory. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Good morning. Thank you for sitting up front. This is a very Baptist group of people. Everybody sits in the back. What I do at my church is I go ahead and intentionally set another row of seats up front so that when everybody sits towards the back, I can go ahead and pull up the front row. And then, Jose, you would be my front row. Good morning. My name is Josh. I am the pastor at Redeemed Church up in Cartersville. Uh, we've had a pretty good week at Redeemed. We got to uh, serve our community yesterday. We had a, a great uh, mission group on Wednesday where we did Southern Cooking. That was excellent. And now we get to join our Journey Group family. For those of you that don't know, we are part of uh, the Journey Network, which is the network of ch- churches here in North Georgia. All of us part of the Acts 29 Network. And our intention is, our mission is to plant churches throughout North Georgia. So Currently, y'all have a, a couple of residents here that hopefully will be the benefits of some of the work that we're doing in Cartersville and the work that's happening uh, in Dallas along with you here. I will tell you this much. I am different than Pastor Jason. I am not looking for a quiet crowd. If I ask you a question, I intend for you to answer me. All right? All right? Good morning. So that's what I'm looking for right there. I'm looking for you to talk back. This is a conversation we're going to have this morning, all right? Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, starts off with the word therefore. Does anybody know what you're supposed to do when you read the... Huh? That's right. We want to go backwards, right? We want to find out the context of what it is that we're about to be reading. Anything that we're told from this point is dependent on what we've just been told. So let's go back. Let's review a little bit about where we're at. Paul wrote this letter. The Apostle Paul wrote this letter to the church in Philippi. Where is he at when he writes this letter? He's in prison, right? Is he in 21st century white-collar prison? No. This is first century Roman prison, all right? There's a lot we could go into there, but what we know about Paul is he's in chains. He calls himself an apostle in chains for Christ. Things are not going good for him right now, and they don't get much better. After a couple of books... It's uh, believed by most scholars that his head is taken off. Like they say in, oh, brother, we're out there. He's in a tight spot. Regardless of his circumstances, though, Paul says that his situation is a reason to rejoice. Regardless where he's at, he says that he's got joy. And the reason that he's got joy is because his agenda is being met. The gospel is going out. Right? From his cell, the gospel is going out, spreading throughout Rome, first through the imperial guard. We know also that there are men and women in Caesar's house now who are hearing the name of Jesus Christ. Amen? That's what's happening through Paul. The brothers back in Philippi and around the church in Jerusalem are now emboldened to preach even greater, the gospel of Jesus Christ because of where Paul is at today. So this is a victory for Paul, right? Now what Paul has just told us is that those of us who are believers in Jesus are part of a community. All right? That by believing in Christ as your Savior, you are brought in to a community. We're not simply a group of people who have something in common. As a matter of fact, we might not have anything in common but one thing. But that one thing, namely that Jesus is our Savior, brings us together in everything. I can look around this room, and I don't know many of you personally, but I can walk through the hallways, and I know you like family. We can look at each other. We love each other, right? I might not know your name, but I I love you this morning. That regardless of our background, 
how much money you have, what kind of work we do, the color of our skin, the language that we speak, or the nation that we are from, because of Christ, we're now a single nation. And he says in chapter 1, in verse 27, to act worthy as citizens of this nation. We're to act worthy as this group of people. Then he goes on to explain that this nation is one that is actually a kingdom. It's not simply a nation on earth. This is a kingdom. And that Jesus is the king of this nation. He says that we are to emulate our king. Our king, he said, who was God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he lowered himself into being born as a man. Being born as a man, he lowered himself to the point of serving men, even to death on a cross. It was actually this selflessness that garnered him to be the king made over everything. Over all of creation, our king. We have a selfless king. That's who we are to emulate, is this king. So we're not to be simply united under a king as a people, but we are to emulate his self, selflessness as citizens of this kingdom. It says that there is a mind that should be one amongst us. That everyone in this room should have a single mind amongst themselves, and that this mind belongs to the citizens of this kingdom which is that we constantly, constantly count other people more significant than we count ourselves, just like our king counted us. So now we get into the text. That's where we're at. Now we get into the text. He starts off, he says, Therefore, since we are citizens of this kingdom, which is ruled by God, he says, As you have always obeyed in my presence, but now much more in my absence. This, there's a reason that this is important. All right? He's going to explain this to us. We're going to come back to it. So we all, we all get this. Some of us are parents here. How many parents we got in the room? You get this, right? You understand what he says as you've obeyed right here in front of my face. When, you, when I'm not around, continue to obey. We understand that. Some of you might be employers at your, at your job. You get this. You know what happens when the cat's away. See, Paul sees these people as his parents, or as, as his children. That's what a pastor does. That's what Pastor Jason thinks of this congregation. He loves you like a parent loves his children. Redeemed church, that's what I, th whether you like it or not, that's the way I feel about you. That's why it's so important that you have a pastor that you respect, because that's the way we're going to look at you. We're going to speak into your life like your spiritual parent. So, Paul sees these people as his children. And we all know what our little angels are like. Sweet little babies. When you're there. My wife, I'll be walking through the house sometime and I'll see my wife standing in the hallway and I'm trying to figure out what's going on. And what she is doing is she's standing here in the hallway, dang near breaking her neck, trying to look in the room while the kids are in there playing just so she can hear the things that they're saying to each other. Because we know what our kids are like when we're not away. We often in the church are just like that. We're very much like that. There is a survey recently that was conducted of people who do not go to church and, and they were polling why, is it, why it is that they don't go to church. The number one reason that people who don't attend church don't attend is because they believe that you and I are hypocrites. They think that we act one way in church, but as soon as we're away from the church, we begin to act another way. In our homes, when we argue, in our workplaces, where we forget our language, at our schools, and to be honest, they're right. They're absolutely right. We are a group of hypocrites, and it often keeps them away. But Paul says, wherever you are at, remember that you are citizens of this kingdom. Act worthy of that title. Realize who you are. 
Realize who you are today in Jesus. Realize that you are a worthy person. You should act worthy because you have been made worthy by Jesus. Our actions often show what we believe to be true about our situation. The way that we act is what we believe about ourselves. A friend of mine recently put it like this. Before you come to know Jesus, you're incapable of doing what Paul is asking you to do this morning. It's impossible. But at the moment that Jesus impresses himself, at the moment of your conversion, there is a connection that is reconnected. We begin becoming reconciled back to who God created us to be initially. We become spiritual beings in a physical form. We reside in a broken body, but the spiritual connection between us and God is reestablished, and we are then given power to rule over our flesh. So we behave righteously when we believe that through Jesus Christ, we have been made righteous. You will act as you believe about yourself. Therefore, Paul says, obey, even in my absence. He says, don't be a hypocrite. And he says, as you're doing this, in verse 12, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, I have a problem with that verse right there. I have heard that verse used against the citizens of the kingdom of God Time after time after time by men with horrible theology that would say that while Jesus earned your salvation, it's now your job to keep it. That your salvation today is not dependent on the blood of Jesus Christ, but it's dependent on your good behavior. And here's the problem with that. Ain't none of us going to make it. Not one of us. It's dependent on Christ. This word fear that we are to work out this salvation with is actually the word phobeo. I hope I said that right. Pastor Jason will get all over my tail. Or phebomai. It means to be put in the flight. It means to work this out with an expectation. It means work out your salvation with a reverence. Work out your sal- salvation with a sense of of all, And then he goes on to explain why we should do this with a, with a sense of reverence. Look at verse 13. For it is God who works in you both to will and work for his good pleasure. At the moment of conversion, at the moment of faith, the believer is immediately stamped with, impressed with. The Holy Spirit is injected into you i want you to understand that the very same spirit that sustained jesus during his temptation lives in you believer the very same spirit the very same spirit that sustained jesus in his trial lives in you believer the very same spirit that sustained Jesus in his suffering at the cross lives in you, believer. He is not saying be terrified. He is not saying be scared. 2 Timothy 1, 7 says, For God gave us a spirit not of fear but of power and of love and of self-control. If the spirit can sustain Jesus at the cross, it can handle whatever you are dealing with today. Do you understand that? If it can get Jesus through the cross, it can handle your trials today. If it can handle Jesus at the cross, it can handle whatever you're being tempted by today. It is a spirit of power. The spirit of God is a spirit of victory. It does not say go about your salvation terrified. It says go about it daily with wonder, with awe, that it is God who is working in you. Psalm 111, Proverbs 9 says that this fear, this awe that you're being asked to work with every day, that 
the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The beginning of wisdom. It does not say salvation is yours, now go try to keep it on your own. Luke chapter 1 verse 50 says, His mercy is for those who fear Him from generation to generation. As citizens of the kingdom of God, He promises, understand this, God promises to complete His will even by willing and working in you. And that is an awesome thing. That is awesome. And to know that you have the very Spirit of God in you working to do this if you are a believer should cause you fear today. It should cause you awe. It should make the hair on the back of your neck stand up like mine is right now. And it says that he does this to fulfill his good pleasure. That's got to be a good thing for me and you. That's got to be a good thing. Let me tell you what Paul knew about this kingdom. Paul knew something about empires and kingdoms. He was a Jew, yes. But did you know that Paul was also a Roman? And as a Roman, do you know what you were free to do? Go anywhere and do as you please without fear of persecution. Or the wrath of all of Rome would come down on your persecutors. Paul was free to go where he wanted. That's why he's in Rome right now. Because they couldn't handle his tail in Jerusalem. They wanted to kill him then. He said, I'm a Roman. Paul knew that being a Roman, being part of that kingdom, came with a great amount of power. But this is also what Paul knew. That being part of this kingdom now was much greater. Much, much greater. No one can accuse you in this kingdom. You can go anywhere on the planet and not a soul can accuse you, believer. You can stand before God Almighty and guess what? There will be no accusations because Christ has already taken the payment for your crimes, all right? That's what it's like to be part of this kingdom. That is why he says in verse 14, do everything without grumbling or arguing. And we had a great opportunity to serve on mission in our community yesterday. I was proud of my church. We were told what to expect before we got there, but I think that it was a little bit more than what we expected. There was a single mom, three kids, deadbeat husband hooked on meth then left them house trashed we found ourselves digging through dog feces and trash where the rats were accumulating and getting into the house but you know what my people had a smile on their face the whole time it's easy to do this when you believe that Christ is in you. It's easy to do. To go, to do these works, to live in this kingdom, it's easy to do when you know Jesus. And you know what I believe? I believe that this woman met Jesus. We prayed on her family afterwards. <clears throat> and she was incapable of containing herself. The tears flowed, snot running out of her nose. She was crying so bad. And the rest of us, were. that's what happens when you meet Christ. You know it, it will break you. I believe that she met Jesus yesterday. I know this much, she at least saw Jesus step into her house and joyfully serve her at all costs. I believe that she met Jesus yesterday. But let's be honest about this. What he's asking us to do here, to go about our business without grumbling, that's the hardest thing to do for us, right? This is one of the areas that is most difficult for us, church. I see it all the time. I mean, we're quick to defend our faith. We are quick to defend our faith. We are quick to take a great amount of pride in the things that we do, but often we go about doing them like a five-year-old that's been told to go to bed. Oh. what we look like out there 
When are we most likely to complain? When are we most likely to question? When we serve? When we have to give up our Saturday, our Saturday, when I have to give up my money, when we are forced to do something we just don't really want to do. And I believe that that says something about us. If that's you today, I believe that that says something about us. There's three things that that is evidence of. Number one, it's evidence that you don't realize who you are in Jesus. You do not understand your identity. You don't understand who you've been made to be. You don't understand who you're going to become. You're a five-year-old going to bed. Number two, it's evidence that you don't see that the reward that you will receive is much greater than the stuff that you're complaining about anyway. The stuff that you're trying to hang on to ain't nothing compared to what you've been promised, to what you're going to be given. You don't understand that. Try to hang on to money that's going to be useless in the kingdom of heaven. Trying to hang on to a Saturday when we got 10,000 years to stand before God. It's evidence that you don't understand the reward that you will be given. Number three, that you don't acknowledge, and this is a big one, that you do not acknowledge that it is God who has done this work in you anyway. It is God that got you to this point anyway. We act like we're just that good. There may be others in this room that needed God to move to impress himself upon them but not me. That's what you're acting like. I'm good already. See, the anchor for our joyful work is that it is God that works in you to will and to act. The implication, the emphasis of that is that he does it in order to fulfill his good purpose. Just like Paul has called us to be a people united, this kingdom, he now calls us to go about this work joyfully to God's good purpose. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what is this purpose we're fulfilling when we go about doing our work joyfully? Look at verse 15, what he says. That you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. See, we are effectively being made into the kingdom of God right here on earth. What is the prayer that we were told to pray? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is who you are, believer. You are that kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And we are set apart in that our example the way we go about our business will usher others into the kingdom as well he says do all things without grumbling that you may be innocent that is not before god that's already been done jesus on the cross you were justified in the midst of this crooked and twisted generation they are the ones who are waiting to accuse you and he says, do this so that you shine as lights in this dark world. Nobody wants to be part of something where everyone in it is miserable. See, that's why Paul said, even when I'm not around, you need to act like a man. You need to act like a citizen worthy of this kingdom, even when I'm not here. Because somebody is always watching you especially if you go about saying, I'm a Christian. They are waiting for you to slip. And every day, by what you choose to do, you are either chasing people to or chasing people from the kingdom of God. See, this is not work out your salvation in terror so that you might be innocent. 
and then you can be children of God. It is you are children of God. Already counted as innocent because Christ counted you as more significant and now he is working in you, through you. Be together in this. Can you do that? Can we do that? Can we come together in the fact that Christ did all of this for you and me? And for goodness sakes, can we do it and go about it having a good attitude so that our accusers might become our brothers and our sisters? That is the point of this. Half of them already think you're a hypocrite anyway. You know why? Because you walk around your life like something stinks in the room. Looking at them. Nobody wants to be part of that. You singing, I got joy in my heart. You are a light in this world. He says, be together. Be in awe of God. Carry yourself like he hasn't told you a lie. And live this out before others. I want you to understand, the Christian life should be lived in any circumstances you find yourself in. Ask Pastor Jason today. The Christian life should be lived in any circumstance in a way that the only way that those people around you can explain it is by the gospel. And God offers you that opportunity daily. Let's say it again. You should be living your life in a way, regardless of what is going on, regardless of how your wife is acting, regardless of what your children have done to the walls, regardless of whether your air conditioning works in the car, regardless of how big a fool your boss is, you should be living in that moment in a way that the only way that people around you can explain that is that he believes something, and I want to believe it too. That's it. We should be living this thing out in a way that forces people to look at what we believe and believe in it too. Because they can see it. We shouldn't be asking people if they want to be saved. We should be living in a way where people are asking us, what must I do to be saved like that jailer in Philippi? We are to be holding on to the word of life Paul says here, so that we can endure all things with joy. As faithful stewards of God's kingdom on earth. That's who you need to be thinking of yourself today. That because Christ lived perfectly, it is counted to you also. That because Christ died for your sin, you will never have to. That you are free today. Backwards and forwards. You are free of all of it. And because Christ rose again to glory, so will you. I want you to understand something. Do you understand that the promise is that you will receive all things that Christ receives? All things that Christ is given will not be kept from you. If he did not spare his life, what else will I keep from you? You will receive everything that Jesus receives. We will receive glory. You will receive glory praise you will receive honor amen see too often we go about our business like we don't believe the promise we will be given glory it means that we will be highly honored because of your selflessness here you will be exalted you will be praised by god himself He says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Praised by God. That word glory that we will receive, doxa in the Greek, it means splendor. Amazing might you will receive. Greatness. It says brightness. And right here Paul says, among whom you shine as lights in the world, the kingdom of God on earth, that brightness coming out we are shining we are to shine in this world when you believe that this is who you are you will shine you will cling to others who shine it will be natural to want to be 
together. And you will stand in the light with them and you will shine and you will draw others who God has called out of the darkness like moths to a flame. Do you believe this? What Paul's asking us to do, it ain't difficult. When you believe this, you know what it sounds like? Go ahead, Ben. Bring that up. about black southern gospel most of these songs were written by men and women who had no good circumstance in their life they didn't have that air conditioning that went out to complain about they didn't have no they didn't have shoes on their feet breaking their back from sun up to sun down tearing the flesh off of their hands but listen to what they got to say see they believe that what they have been promised they will receive. They believe that what they are headed to is greater than what they see before them. I love this. Regardless of your circumstances, regardless of what it costs you today, regardless of whether you are in the presence of others in this kingdom or not, you shine and others will see and God will be given great glory in your life no wonder bring that down no wonder Paul at the end of this is able to say 17 I am glad in my prison cell No wonder he was able to say that he was proud, even if he were poured out as an offering. And he was. <laughs> I am glad and I rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Can we rejoice in this this morning? Can we rejoice in a promise? Can we go about doing our business together in a way that looks like we believe it? The promise is greater than what you see before you. And your behavior has a great purpose in it. Can we rejoice this morning? Let's pray.